This episode of Literary Treks is brought to you by Audible.com, offering more than 180,000 titles for smartphone, tablet, and desktop. To get a free audiobook of your choice and to help Trek FM at the same time, visit audibletrial.com slash trekfm. And also by Enterprise in Space, an international program of the nonprofit National Space Society. Find out how you can help science and education and become a virtual crew member aboard the NSS Enterprise Orbiter by visiting enterpriseinspace.org. And if you want to join the conversation and share your thoughts on this episode, join the Babel Conference, our listeners group on Facebook. Just type B-A-B-E-L into the Facebook search field. We look forward to seeing you there. Hey everyone, I'm Rod Roddenberry and you're listening to Trek FM. taking all these books? I thought I'd take some light reading, in case I got bored. Welcome, everyone, to another episode of Literary Treks. This is episode number 300, your official Star Trek books and comics podcast of the Trek FM network. I'm Bruce Gibson, and for the 300th time, here is Dan Gunther. (laughs) (laughs) Hey, Bruce. Now, just to clarify, I've not been on for 300 episodes, but... This show has been on for 300 episodes, so. It has, yeah. We haven't been here for 300 episodes. I've listened to all 300 episodes. <laughs> Me I, too, yep. Yeah, you too, but we haven't been on all of them. Of course, this started with episode one with Christopher Jones, the founder and editor of Trek FM, and Matt Rushing. They co-hosted this together for quite a while, and then Dan joined when Chris left, and then I joined after Matt left. And we're still trucking along. We're still going. And to celebrate this occasion, episode 300, I thought we need to do something big. So we gathered all our favorite Trek FM hosts together, and we're doing a audio drama of Star Trek V, the Final Frontier novelization. I love it. What an excellent idea. I am (laughs) totally on board with this. (laughs) So... We're going to st- uh, I, no. Okay, I'm sorry. No, we're not doing that. I thought it was a good idea, but then I realized Standard Orbit did that for their 300th with the script from Star Trek V, The Final Frontier. But So we're not going to do the novelization because it's really not all that different. Yeah, the script was probably <laughs> a better idea, actually, now that I think about it. <laughs> and the other reason I'm saying this is because we really don't have any ideas for the 300th. So... There isn't any big celebration going on. That's as close as you're going to get right there. So. <laughs> you know, we're a pretty low key podcast. You know, we we don't we don't have a lot of bells and whistles. That's kind of the nature of what we do. We read books and we re- read comics. These are things that are usually done in a place of quiet and alone with our thoughts and enjoying a book. And you know, it's kind of appropriate that we're not loud and in your face and big and celebratory. I, I think it's kind of fitting that uh, I'm I'm just making excuses for us not having thought of anything. I'm sorry. Yeah, I've got nothing. No. Yeah, got nothing. Although we did uh, hide some microphones in Dan's house and we have audio of what it sounds like of when he's reading. And that's it. Isn't wow. that exciting? <laughs> There's like a no noise. You're a very quiet reader. Yeah, I mean, most of the books I've been reading lately have been on an ebook, so I was waiting for the page flip, but I realized there's not even that. So now hmm. I heard a slight tap in the background at one point. Just oh a yeah, slight yeah. tap. Oh, there it is. Yeah, yeah, I heard that. Yeah, so that's that was really exciting. So it, it sounds about the same when I read too. 
Amazing. Amazing. <laughs> you know, all our listeners out there, please, by all means, share your reading sounds with us <laughs> and well, we'll play them on literary tracks. No, we probably won't. <laughs> no, I'm sure there's some sounds that are made while you're reading that we don't want to hear. So um, please don't send those to us, please. Um, well, if you do, I'll listen anyway. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think there's ever been a show where somebody asks for the sounds of people reading. <laughs> it's just another one of the many firsts here on Literary Tracks. And that's why we've reached 300. Oh, yes. That means we're more mature now. Sure. <laughs> okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, if you're still listening on uh, the feature today, we're reviewing a new TOS novel. And this is written by Christopher L. Bennett, and it is The Higher Frontier. So we're going to talk about that, as I said in the feature. But before we do that, we do have a news item. And we have, speaking of TOS, a new TOS novel that will be coming out. This is the first I've heard of it. And it's a contest, it's called A Contest of Principles. And it's written by Greg Cox. I did not, and I didn't spend a lot of time researching, but I did not find a release date for this. So I have no idea. I saw that he mentioned it's coming in November. I don't know the exact date, but I, I, I had read somewhere that it would be November was uh, the release month. So we've narrowed it down to 30 days anyway. <laughs> okay. So it sounds like by the end of the year, we will have this book. So, but we got in a little synopsis of it too, of what would be on the back cover of the book. So in traditional fashion, I'm going to ask Dan to read the synopsis to A Contest of Principles. An epic new Star Trek saga by New York Times bestselling author Greg Cox set during the original five-year mission. The planet Vok is holding its first free elections after years of oppressive military rule. Captain James T. Kirk and the crew of the Starship Enterprise have been dispatched by Starfleet to serve as impartial observers, but remaining neutral proves a challenge as Kirk confronts a tangled web of scandal, conspiracy, and assassination plots, with the stability of an entire sector at stake. To make matters worse, Dr. Leonard McCoy has vanished while on a mission of mercy to Bracco, a nearby planet only a system away. With Kirk unable to abandon his vital mission on Vok to hunt for his friend, it's up to First Officer Spock and Christine Chapel to lead a team in search of the missing doctor, even if it means risking whatever fate befell McCoy. Unknown to his friends and crewmates, however, McCoy has been spirited away to another world, Ozalore, where he's expected to find a cure for a mysterious ailment plaguing a member of the planet's ruling family. Torn between his Hippocratic Oath and his desire to escape, McCoy finds himself at the center of deadly palace intrigues and a struggle for power that may ultimately consume all three worlds. Oh my. <laughs> <laughs> Very dramatic. <laughs> it is. All right, so another one during the five-year mission. They have a lot going on in those five years, for sure. Yeah, I mean... It's uh, it's definitely a busy time for those people. That's a uh, that's a lot of <laughs> a lot of missions. But uh, excited to get another one though for sure. And this one sounds really interesting. I've always enjoyed Greg Cox's work. His latest one, which was the Antares Maelstrom, was a really great read as well. So I'm yes. eager to see what he's got coming up. Yeah, and I love uh, novels that kind of center around McCoy. Give. McCoy a lot to do. So mm -hmm. I have a feeling this will be a really good one. Yeah, I saw online he also mentioned that he's never gotten a lot of chance to write Christine Chapel. Uh so but he said he really enjoyed writing her in this novel. So that should be cool. Yeah, I thought about that because when it, you read it and it said Spock and Chapel lead a team, I was like, Oh, well that would be interesting. We don't see a lot of that, of those two leading a team mm -hmm. trying to find a missing McCoy. <laughs> so that would be cool. <laughs> yeah, for sure. All right, so by the end of the year, looks like we're going to have it. So we don't have a cover, so we haven't reviewed the cover. We can't give any stamps right now. So uh, thanks to Greg Cox for getting the synopsis out there so we could read it and uh, looking forward to it. That being said, we have some listener feedback in the Babel Conference, our official listeners group on Facebook. 
And uh, let's see here. That episode was called, and I have it right in front of me, so why am I acting like I need to look for it? It's right here. It's called, We Need a Kick in Our Complacency. I need a kick in mine, too. Um, <laughs> so that was episode number 299. And that was when we reviewed the book, Losing the Peace, the TNG book, and we had Brandy Jackal on to review that with us. And so the first comment we have is from Chris Hill. It says, bringing this over from Twitter, if anyone needs someone to just listen to them, vent or talk, I'm always available. Okay, so let's put a little context to that, because I don't think Chris is just saying, hey, anybody want to talk? Just give me a... So, you know, we kind of address some things in this book that also relate to what's going on in the world right now with the coronavirus. And uh, yeah, when we posted this on Twitter, he put that offer out there and he was doing that also here in the Babel conference. And you know, it's important. Mental health is a much more fragile thing than I think a lot of us care to admit. So that's definitely appreciated. And uh, I'd like to extend that as well. You know, if, People need to talk, friends, family, listeners, you know, reach out to us. We're always happy to engage with people who are going through a tough time. Yeah, absolutely. For sure. Well, Oz Trek, he says, firstly, I hope Brandy makes a full recovery. It's pretty scary out there at the moment. Hope you are better soon, Brandy. He goes on to say, I love how seamlessly the cameos of previously seen characters are written into the story. There is a lot of hurt and pain in this book. There's not one character that hasn't been affected by the Borg invasion. They've all lost somebody and are all helping each other heal. Through it all, though, Picard and the Enterprise crew remind everyone it's still right to help others, even if your own situation is not ideal, and that no matter what century or planet you are on, most politicians still have their heads up their asses and believe their own self-importance. I did enjoy the scene where Picard quoted Kirk to Admiral Akaar and the Admiral's reaction, the one person's wisdom Akaar won't argue against. I liked that Akaar concluded that Starfleet needed another captain who was like Kirk out there more than it needed another Admiral. I give this 4.75 trees planted to reclaim hope and remember who are gone. P.S. I love the new cover of Dayton's new book and the story sounds great too. Yes, thank you Oz Trucky for that and... Clint Philip DeSada says, good book. Next, Dan, you do the next one. (laughs) I don't know. I don't really like how this has worked out, but uh, (laughs) yeah, short and sweet and to the point, Clint. Thanks for that. Let me also mention (laughs) that uh, Clint also posted later in the same thread, actually, with everything going on around the world lately, I started reading this book again. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a good point. You know, when we're all stuck at home, what a great time to read some Star Trek novels, Mm -hmm. you know, catch up on some things. Yeah, definitely. It's, it's a good time to find those things that bring us comfort and make us feel whole and good. And for me, that's always been Star Trek and, you know, the television shows, but also the novels as well. So that's a really good point. Yeah, absolutely. I, I find myself, like if I'm ever just feeling down or whatever about what's going on, I'm just like, Oh, I want to get out of this funk. Ooh, Star Trek. <laughs> and I mean, immediately boom, turns me around. Definitely. So that's great. So Justin Ozer, I'm going to save you, Dan, cause you read Oz Trekkie's long one. So I'm going to read <laughs> Justin Ozer's long one here too. So he says, yeah, I know what you're saying right now, Justin. You're like, oh, I, I don't make them long because I don't want you to feel like you have to read the whole thing. But I'm going to anyway, Justin. I'm going to read the whole thing. Challenge accepted. <laughs> <laughs> Justin says, Brandy, I hope you and Dave are feeling better now. And side note, Dave is Brandy's husband. Okay. Great discussion on a novel that I loved. It was very interesting to hear Brandy's perspective as someone who hasn't read Destiny or some of the TNG novels before that. Glad to hear that the little recaps they do are helpful. I don't mind them at all, as it's rare that they take up too much room. I read Destiny and all the post-Nemesis TNG novels before Destiny, and most of the ones after. However, I never read Losing the Peace before. I didn't know what to expect, and I was delighted with the whole novel. Chowdhury and Chen are two of my favorite characters in the novels. I love their unique perspectives on life, and seeing how they've been impacted by the events of Destiny really brings home the impact on a personal level. I love the focus on Dr. Crusher. She's absolutely amazing in everything she does in this novel, and the backstory that we get is great. It was always great to see Barash from Future Imperfect. What a great follow-up for him. 
I've always been fascinated by the on-screen references I've gotten to Pacifica. I've really enjoyed seeing Ailey Levina in the Titan novels. She's not in the novel, but we get to see a great variety of Selkie characters as they deal with the influx of refugees. I just loved reading descriptions of the planet and the society, and I want to read more about them. As you mentioned, the focus on the refugee situation is very relevant, and the author did a fantastic job in telling a poignant and important story. I give the novel five out of five. Dr. Crusher's doing an incredible job in saving as many lives as she can. You know, we could really use five out of five Dr. Crusher's doing an incredible job saving as many lives as she can right now. (laughs) (laughs) Do do you have those thoughts? I think about things when they're like, I watch the news and they're like, well, we're trying to still figure out what we can do. I'm like, I bet McCoy or Crusher or Bashir, like I'm thinking all the Trek doctors, they would have gotten this figured out by now. They'd get this figured out within 43 to 45 minutes usually, you know, definitely inside of an hour with some time for commercial breaks. (laughs) (laughs) All right. Oh, I only Uh, wish. Well, thanks everyone for all your feedback in the Babel Conference. We love it and we love engaging with you on that. And uh, also, you know, feel free to engage with us on our Twitter account. Dan and I have a Twitter account called Positively Trek. You can just go at Positively Trek. And we have a new podcast that is also called the same thing, Positively Trek. And I think we've got, what, six, seven episodes, eight episodes, I don't know, by the time this comes out, a handful of them. Mm -hmm. So check them out. Because you know what? We love talking about books, but we like talking about Star Trek, too. Absolutely. So check those out. Here's the feature. Turn that page. So this past March, we received a new TOS, that stands for the original series, for all the people out there that don't know, novel written by Christopher L. Bennett called The Higher Frontier. So this is a new novel, and I'm excited about the fact that it takes place post the motion picture because I want more during that time frame in the movie era time frame. I'm fine with the five year mission books, but like I said earlier in the news, we get a lot in that time period. So I like to explore different time periods. So I was excited about that. Mm-hmm. Um, Dan, were you excited? I bet you were. I can tell. Definitely. Yeah. That's a time period, like you say, that doesn't get explored enough. Christopher L. Bennett himself has done a few stories set in there, but most people tend to set things during like that original five-year mission with the bright, you know, yellow, blue, and red shirts kind of thing. But I I love this period. There's a whole second five-year mission in there after the motion picture where Kirk takes the Enterprise back out for another five-year mission before coming back and getting promoted again to Admiral and uh, then the status quo is what we see in Star Trek too. So this is kind of interesting because it takes place kind of at the tail end of that five year mission. And then we see the beginning of like the maroon uniform just before Star Trek two stuff. So yeah. it's right in there. And I love that period of time. Yeah. So do I, um, I, I mean, I think most people pit tend to gravitate to picking up a original, a uh, five-year mission book. That's why we get a lot more of those. Mm-hmm. But I loved how this book, and I'm already jumping ahead in some ways, but I love how this book kind of pulls that thread in of the second five-year mission and moving beyond that to when we get to Starfleet Academy and the bridge that Adm- Captain to Admiral Kirk takes and all the other crew members and what they're doing. And we'll touch a little bit probably on that more as we go along. But the book does start off with the uh, Enar on Andoria, and they have been brutally attacked to the point of extinction. And the Enterprise crew visits the Andorian Homeworld Security Facility, and guess who we get to meet? We meet Captain Shazava, and you're like, well, I don't know who that is. Well, you probably don't. But you probably might know who Commander Thalen is from the TAS episode yesteryear remember Mm -hmm. the andorian first officer of the enterprise when the timeline changed he's in this book yeah i thought that was a great idea i like i like the allusions that they make to that episode as well because you know it's a classified mission they can't tell anybody who wasn't directly involved so any when they first encounter thalen kirk and spock kind of look at each other and they're like oh (laughs) and even like I would say almost playfully Spock kind of makes oblique references to that when he's talking to Thalen. Like he says, uh, I can't remember exactly, but he said, live long and prosper in your 
other life or something like that, which is kind of how he said that to, yeah, how he greeted and left Thalen in yesteryear as well. I haven't gone back and watched it. So I, this is just all from memory, but I was like, Oh, that's a little, he's being a little cheeky there, I think, but you know, it's, it's fun. I like that. They reference that. Me too. And I like the fact that when you watch the animated series and you see Thalen, of course, Andorians are blue, but he is colored more gray in that series in that episode. And yet in here, we're, we're told that, well, it's because he's one quarter Enar mm -hmm. and the Enars, of course, are pale. So he's like the in-between, in a sense, of the blue and the pale white, you know, and I, thought that's, yeah. that's, I love that. That's brilliant. Yeah. And I think that had been brought up in a previous book as well, where he appeared, I think in the myriad universes. Um, I don't know which story, but yes. I, I think it was mentioned that he had Enar ancestry as well, which was uh, contributed to that coloration. So I, it's a brilliant idea, which makes a lot of sense. I love it. I, I, I love it too. And there's a lot of that, that, that Chris does in these books um, or in his books and especially this one. So um, anyway, so we come upon the Enar, they've been attacked. And as Thalen and Spock and Kirk are visiting the settlement, you know, where the, the Enar had lived, they start to conclude that somehow people seem to just beam in, but there, there were shields and, or something. And so there's no way somebody could beamed in. So it could have been within or whatever. And they start talking about, it. it's almost like some, the, the attackers were phantoms and, and Thalen says they were Naj, N A A. Z H. So I'm assuming it's Naj. <laughs> <I don't know. laughs> but, but which means an Andorian, a phantom from ancient myth. Mm -hmm. and so that's kind of the villain name that we play with throughout this book. Yeah. And I, I thought it was a good way to title that villain. You know, they don't know exactly who they are, but they have to have a name. And, you know, it makes sense that, you know, this imagery from their ancient myths would kind of come into play you know, phantoms, spirits, demons are, are something that, you know, we call things a lot and that kind of thing. So it, it definitely makes sense. And uh, it's a good name. It's it's good fear inducing name, something that means something to people in the Andorian culture. Yeah. And, you know, the question then was, well, why were the Enar attacked? I mean, they were already becoming extinct and now they're pretty much extinct. Some of the Enar uh, had lived in other places on Andor or whatever, but the majority of the population is gone. And, you know, they didn't really know why. They didn't know if it was because they have their telepathic abilities, if that had something to do with it, because there are some extreme groups that want to attack telepaths, which we'll get into a little more later. But um, I was very interested in this because... The Enar were inter introduced in Star Trek Enterprise. And there's actually an episode called The Enar. And we've not really seen much of them, of course, in the TV shows. We haven't seen them at all in TOS and series that followed with it. So it was cool to see them worked into a TOS story. Mm -hmm. But then it also kind of explains the fact that they're pretty much extinct at this point, that we don't see them yeah. later. So that kind of answers that question, if it, even if it is a question. Mm -hmm. You know, it, it's it's something that, you know, they were isolated to begin with anyway. But, uh, you know, and I think there had been references in the TNG novels. I, I want to say the Typhon Pack novels where they're talking about Andor and the Andorian fertility crisis. And there was like a mention that the Enar had gone extinct like a hundred years earlier or something like that. So... It's kind of interesting. We're finally seeing that play out here, how that happened and, you know, what the ultimate fate of the Enar is, because, you know, without going into direct spoilers here, not all is quite as it seems when we get to a certain point in the novel. <laughs> oh, really? Do tell, Dan, do tell. Well, well no, you're right. We'll hold off. We'll right? get there. <laughs> the other thing I want to touch on is are the new humans. Mm -hmm. I found this to be interesting. So on the Enterprise, we learned that there's a few crew members that are that have this uh, psionic ability 
they're like telepaths or, you know, that they're psychic or whatever. Well, they're not psychic, but one of them is DeFalco, DeFalco who we saw in the motion picture. She was on the bridge and she was played by William Shatner's wife at the time. Mm-hmm. Yeah, she was the, if you might remember, she was the relief navigator after Ilea got taken by V'ger. Well, there you go. Little did you know that she has psionic abilities. Mm -hmm. So we start to find out that others on Earth also have these abilities, and they really started to become more prominent after the V'ger incident from the motion picture. And this, the setting for this point in time in the novel is about four years after V'ger. So it's not something that immediately happens after V'ger. I mean, they start to to, you know, these abilities start to come out shortly after that. But now this is four years later. So they've been living with these abilities. They've been learning how to use these abilities and they refer to themselves as new humans. But they're also now finding out that they are going to, they're going to be hunted, which we find out as the book goes on. So Dan, I wanted to ask you about what you thought about the concept of the new humans and without getting into spoilers, because there are some things we learn more about these new humans, but you know, Gene Roddenberry referred to something called new human or new humans in his novelization of the motion picture. And these aren't quite the same. Mm -hmm. No, they're a little different. So Christopher Bennett did kind of borrow the name and, and kind of the loose concept of them from that novelization, but they are a little different in certain ways. So kind of like those ones in the novelization, they, they seem to kind of commune with each other and live in communes. And there's some reference to them uh, having a little bit more of kind of a, I don't know how to put it, maybe an open view of, of relationships and how they relate to one another kind of thing. But the telepathy thing is, I think, think if I'm remembering correctly, not something that's gone into in the motion picture novelization. I may be misremembering some of that, but I don't think that was an aspect of them in that book. I, I think I, I can't remember for sure, but I think that could be maybe a small piece, but nothing that's fully developed, but it was more about the intellect that they're highly intelligent, the new humans. Right. And then I, th the other thing that I remember from the novelization of the motion picture was that there weren't a lot of them in Starfleet because Starfleet was worried that they'd be seduced by like all these amazing higher order life forms, like non-corporeal life forms or godlike beings. Uh, whereas, you know, the throwbacks, the more primitive people <laughs> tend to do better in Starfleet because they wouldn't be uh, tempted by higher level life forms, I guess, or something like that. Yeah. And if anybody's interested, we did review the novelization this past fall with Larry Nemechek. I don't remember the episode number, but you can go back and look through our catalog and try to find that if you haven't listened to it. Um, but yeah, I thought it was an interesting idea, the new humans, and to see that certain crew members on the ship are humans and have these abilities. Mm -hmm. that they can do this and they're, they're kind of bonded together. And it felt very much like it was appropriate for this time frame. It felt like something that should follow the motion picture, in my opinion. It just, it just felt right for me. Yeah, and I don't know exactly why that is, but I know what you mean. Like, it feels like, I don't know if it's a combination of, like, the costuming of the motion picture, if there's just, like, a feeling of kind of new agey type hippie yeah. stuff, maybe. I, I that. I'm being very generalizing and, and it sounds like I'm putting that down. I'm really not, but it just feels like it fits in with that kind of environment that had been created for the motion picture and, and kind of Gene Roddenberry's ideas at this time going forward, if that makes sense. Yeah, that it makes sense to me. It, it, yeah. I don't know how to put it into words either, but yeah, for, for some reason it just felt right for this time. For some reason, and maybe because we don't know a whole lot about this time period, mm -hmm. you know, because if this was during the original five year mission, we'd be like, okay, this is weird. We've never seen crew members like this before. And now we're in a time period that is kind of loose. There's not a lot of 
depth into this time that, oh, well, maybe this has been going on. And since it has been happening since V'ger, but there's questions in the novel is like, well, why would V'ger cause this? Why would all of a sudden some humans have these psionic abilities that they didn't necessarily have before because of V'ger? And some of their thoughts were, well, when Will Decker merged in with V'ger, it somehow sent something off through humanity. And I mean, there's there's a lot of it's it's interesting to hear these theories. Like it it does kind of sound like something that might get forwarded in Facebook nowadays or something like that. Like the things the government doesn't want you to know, you know? <laughs> it, it it does feel like there's this kind of um new agey pseudoscience aspect to it, if that makes sense. Well, speaking of this these time frames and such and about the original five year mission with the original series, we do go back to an episode called Is There in Truth No Beauty? And in a lot of ways this novel is a sequel to that episode. I don't want to portray it as like this is a direct sequel, but a good portion of this book really does build and play off of that episode. So we have Amanda Kalos. Now I'm saying Kalos because I was watching the episode and they said it that way, but it's spelled K-O-L-L-O-S. So I want to say Kolos, but they didn't say it that way on the show. So <laughs> Ambassador Kolos and Miranda Jones are investigating the attacks on these telepathic pacifists. Now these characters and their psionic abilities are integral to the story. So do we like that this story is a sequel to the episode from TOS? Because I mean, this isn't really a favorite episode of mine, and it's one that I haven't really watched all that often, so I did go back and rewatch it. But I will say, because I rewatched it, it really got me more into this novel. I was already Hmm. into the novel, but I was halfway through the novel and watched the episode, and it just charged me even more to get excited about what was coming up next. Nice. Yeah, this is also not really a favorite one of mine. I'm... I do like the fact that these characters are a part of this story and Christopher Bennett kind of tends to do this a lot when he brings in elements from the original series. Parts of this book feel like a bit of a, an apology for some of the aspects of that episode, if that makes sense. So yes, there are some of those. Yes. Yeah, definitely. Because in that episode and, and Kirk himself basically says this, he acted shamefully towards dr jones and didn't treat her as a professional but instead like if you watch that episode basically they they want to get in contact with ambassador Kolos, Kolos, whatever and you know get him to help them send the enterprise out of this void that they get stuck in so spock's going to meld with the ambassador and kirk basically like distracts Miranda Jones by trying to seduce her and sweep her off her feet and stuff. And it's really kind of gross. Uh, so, you know, part of this episode is Kirk saying like, yeah, that was low of me. I can't believe I did that. And, you know, I'm sorry and all this stuff. So it, it's, you know, I, I don't necessarily like throwing this term around a lot, but it's problematic. There's some is- issues with that episode. Um, but, you know, the fact that these characters come back, I, I I think that's a good thing. For one thing, I really like Diana Moldar. I was it was fun to imagine her back in this role again because that was one thing that I liked in that episode was her performance of that role. No, I agree. And and for those that don't remember, she played Pulaski in T and G in the second season. Um and she was also in another episode of TOS. Mm-hmm. <laughs> She's been around the block. Um, the Star Trek block, at least. Um, yeah, I oh, I loved her on LA Law. Well, oh, don't don't get me into that. She, yeah, the elevator. Um, <laughs> so, but um, yeah, I yeah I agree with you. It's I feel that, and I've seen this in other novels too, where things that were shot in the series in the '60s are different than how they would be portrayed now, and so sometimes things are a little sexist and. There's other things, too, that just don't seem to fit right into today. And so some of these novels will try to help that out a little. Mm -hmm. I don't want to say I was almost going to say make excuses, but that's not the right word. But help it out a little. And the fact that, you know, Kirk realized, oh, I did something I was wrong. And, you know, and Miranda Jones says, it's okay. I'm fine. I'm used to it. It's happened before. I'm cool with it. So it was just, you know, 
Yeah, it it's, it's something we've and, said in a previous episode, and I think it might have even been another Christopher L. Bennett book, is these things tend to smooth over the rough edges of canon a little bit. You know, the yes. things that are, you know, maybe don't fit in with the kind of more modern sensibilities. You know, a lot of these novels kind of smooth those over and, and make them fit a little better. And yeah, and novels will do that with inconsistencies in episodes. So that's what's so great about the novels, the fine cra- creative clever ways to do that Mm -hmm. so um i want to move forward but at this point i'm going to throw the little spoiler alert out there because we're going to dig deeper into this book now so if you haven't read it do like we always tell you turn this off go (laughs) read the book and come back and listen to the rest it's one of the few moments that podcast hosts will tell you to turn off a podcast (laughs) (laughs) And maybe you've already turned it off and you haven't even heard me say this. So I don't know. Anyway. um, (laughs) So Miranda explains that this group of incorporeal psionic life forms were driven from their homes because they had the ability to travel to other dimensions. And when I say, okay, so let me back up a little. (laughs) It didn't really quite make sense. I'm just reading my notes, but I haven't really explained. We find out for example, that the new humans have these abilities, it's not natural. It's not because the human race has been advancing. It's because these other beings have been in their bodies for millennium. I mean, it's like, or even more, it's just, you know, they were escaping a planet where they were, there were the specters and there were the lords. And the specters had these abilities to travel to other dimensions. Well, the lords were purist, and they felt that their home is the continuum and shouldn't be left and traveled to, and so they started hunting down these specters. So the specters went to hide, and how they did it was they inhabited other beings to hide from the lords. And so they've inhabited themselves into hu- some humans. They inhabited themselves in the Enar. So mm-hmm. these are not naturally psionic creatures. They had these beings in them and they weren't even aware of them because they kept themselves very isolated, hidden inside that the abilities weren't even noticed for a while. And it wasn't, and it, the V'ger incident does, well, maybe I don't want to touch on the V'ger thing quite yet, Dan. I want to know what you thought about this concept. I definitely thought it was an interesting one. It's it's one that like I don't have a problem with it. I think it was kind of a neat explanation for why some humans have extra sensory extra sensory perception and we kind of get the backstory fill in that for example in the TOS episode the second pilot where no man has gone before Gary Mitchell and Elizabeth Daner would be two such humans who had one of these specters kind of riding along with them and that's kind of linked to everything that happened in that episode as well so it's kind of one of these neat things that threads through star trek continuity and links a bunch of things together that weren't definitely weren't linked originally and i I always enjoy that it adds a new layer to the story and makes me consider past trek in a way that i hadn't before I also think it's an interesting nod to what we talked about earlier with the Gene Roddenberry concept of new humans, the whole idea that there weren't a lot of them in Starfleet because they would get seduced by non-corporeal higher life forms. And that's kind of what happened here, even though they weren't aware of it, these higher beings, these non-corporeal beings were kind of hitching a ride along with these people that call themselves new humans and the Enar and that sort of thing. And when it all comes down to it, you know, some of them, most of them are okay with it. These, these things have been with them for years, sometimes generations, sometimes it's passed down through the family apparently. Uh, But some of them aren't really okay with it. Some of them don't appreciate the fact that they've played host to a stowaway basically. And the whole thing of the specters is they, they were lying dormant. They were basically hiding in these in these corporeal life forms the enar and the humans but they weren't doing anything they weren't affecting any kind of change on purpose they were just hiding and and kind of watching the life of the people they were in for the longest time 
it's kind of an interest, interesting addition to the lore, I think. Yeah, because if they had started doing something, then the lords would be able to find them. Exactly. They'd be discovered. They were basically refugees hiding out, kind of. Uh, like, you know, somebody, I don't know, hiding in your basement or something. <laughs> but, you know, trying not to be discovered either by outside people or by the people they're hiding with. Yeah, and I'm trying to remember, I mean, they, they weren't going to hide forever, were they? I mean... They had to have a plan at some point. They just couldn't just be dormant forever. Yeah. I, I think I think eventually there was like to be a plan. Like this definitely was an act of desperation. It wasn't um, you know, something that had been really thought through. I think it was just that was what they had to do to stay hidden and safe. And the the thing to remember is the lifespans of these creatures is many more times than a humans or an Enars. So, you know, maybe their long-term plan was to hope that the government of the Lords gets overthrown or something like that, which, you know, is something that we kind of see hinted at towards the end of the book that that may happen. Uh, but, you know, for now, it seems like really long-term to us, but to them, it might not have quite been as long as like we would perceive that they were hiding. Yeah. And they're so dormant that, you know, right now, Dan, you could have a specter in you and you don't know it. Exactly. Yeah. For all your life. Yeah. And like maybe uh, my, my parents did or something like that. And then, you know, when they pass away or you know, they, they, it would get passed to me and I would never know it kind of thing. Yeah. And then there's people who feel like they have some kind of psychic abilities in our world today that, well, it could be because they have a specter in there and they're kind of <laughs> tapping into that. The Mr. Cleo, Mr. Cleo is just a specter. <laughs> and, and yeah. And the thing about these specters is that they did years and years, whatever millennia ago, who knows how long they did go into other beings that had more psychic type abilities, but they they were more easily found because of that. They went into beings that didn't have that psi ability to, because then they could hide more dormant in those kind of people. Now, when V'ger happened, here's the thing. The reason why all of a sudden humans started to find these abilities in themselves after V'ger is because when V'ger, I almost wanted to say exploded, but not necessarily, but became a new life, there, there was a fear from the specters that that beam, that whatever plane of, of being that it moved to would call attention towards earth or to the alpha quadrant or whatever. And the Lords would start looking. And so all of a sudden the specters were almost like gearing to get ready to fight or something. Yeah. It was, they were worried it would be kind of like a beacon drawing the, yeah. the Lords to them. Kind of thing. It was a lighthouse. Yeah. <laughs> the feature <Vigil> lighthouse. <laughs> Which I thought was a great explanation because I was really wondering, like, how would these be linked? Like, how would that do that? And I, I love that it wasn't some kind of, like, higher plane mystical thing. It was literally like, oh, no, this big thing happened. This big thing went off. And, you know, it, it's like shining a spotlight on their hiding place, basically. And they're just worried about that. So they're, you know, like you said, gearing up for war, basically. Yeah. And and how do you feel the fact that the Enar are not naturally uh, psionic life forms now? I thought that was, I mean, I, I didn't have a problem with that. I think it's an interesting explanation for why they would differ in that way from the regular Andorians. Uh, you know, I, I don't think there's anything, it's been a while since I've watched those Enterprise episodes. I don't know that there's anything that would preclude that. So, uh, you know, I think it's, and, and, and given the ultimate fate of the Enar at the end of this episode. So as far as, you know, the rest of the galaxy is concerned, the Enar are extinct, but they're actually not all extinct apparently. So, uh, there's, there's maybe a way they might come back later by the sounds of it. But uh, yeah, no, I, I think it's just an interesting addition to their story for, for a subspecies that we didn't see a lot of. It's kind of neat to learn a little bit more about them. So going then to the, the Naj, 
these beings that were attacking the Enar and they're also now attacking new humans because now we've we've gathered what remaining Enar and new humans and stuff they're on the enterprise to be protected but then of course they're getting attacked again we we don't really know who these people are but they they've got these this body armor on and each one each individual has different colors and then they have this this belt on with almost like this glowing crystal where they can all of a sudden just bring out different weapons. It's like they can just think of a weapon and it just comes out and they use to fight. And, and they're not interested in killing anybody else, but except for these psionic life forms, the new humans and the Enar. And we find out that it's in a sense, you know, this is a hate group and these are humans and other life forms that are embodied with the Lords in them. At first we don't know that, but now we find out it's just like the specters uh, going into some human life forms. We also have the lords going in. But in this case, it's more that not that they just take over the bodies, but these are people who already were in fear of seeing non psychic type life forms not being natural, like Vulcans are naturally have these abilities, but these other life forms don't. And so why is this happening unnaturally? And so there's this fear or this hate about these groups. And so they welcome the Lords into their bodies to help fight them. Yeah. This, this to me struck me. I mean, this is where I'm definitely seeing the parallels between this and the real world. And you might ask like, what kind of parallels could there be between psionic life forms inhabiting people (laughs) into the real world. But it seems to me like a lot of the ways that these lords are kind of recruiting the corporeal beings. So these are people, members of the Federation, like humans and uh, Vulcan in one case, you know, they're recruiting these people into their group by kind of appealing to their, I want to say supremacist views. So for example, this guy by the name of Yamasaki believes that you know humans aren't naturally uh endowed with psychic gifts and so that's kind of a threat to the purity of the human race and there's a lot of reasons for that he comes from a community that was threatened by that was founded by you know people who were threatened by the augments under khan and other members of the community were threatened by the Sulaban of the Cabal who received genetic enhancements and all this kind of stuff. So there's that kind of fear built in and it, it really comes down to like a parallel to what I see in today's world with, you know, far right groups and white supremacists and that sort of thing. And the Lords themselves could be seen as that as well, because they have a hatred of, corporeal life forms of all life forms that aren't like them and the specters, whereas the specters are more open to all different kinds of life. So, you know, the Lords recruit these people that they hate and just use them to kind of further their cause. And like, I I see that in today's world, you get the, you get leaders who maybe don't completely believe in you know, the, the hatred they're espousing, but they play on other people's hatred to use them to further their own goals kind of thing. And that's kind of how I saw that playing out there. Yeah. And fear, fear is also a motivation behind these things too. And it it does it, it feel even like Star Trek and the fact that we have Federation members and, and members uh, of Starfleet who are, against this and are are looking to kill these individuals yeah it's it's definitely something that you know comes up in the novel and spock even at one point laments the fact that you know maybe all of the people of the federation aren't as united and and logical thinking as we would like them to be like it turns out that maybe there are still a lot of prejudices and hatreds that are prevalent that we haven't completely gotten over. And I mean, we even see that when we get to Star Trek six with Kirk and Klingons, like this is not something that's completely unheard of in Star Trek. So it's, uh, it's definitely playing on those feelings and, you know, amplifying them, I think certainly taking them and twisting them into something even more horrific than maybe just a little bit of prejudice that 
I, I honestly think every human being carries at some point in their life, but taking that, amplifying it and twisting it into something even more dark and horrific here. And again, once it, it proves, if you take the whole of all Star Trek that we've gotten just on screen, I mean, people of this time period, yeah, they aren't perfect. There's still some people with hate. There's still people with prejudice. It still exists. You know, we, we've gotten better as a society at this point, but there's still some individuals out there. You know, we're still human. We're not perfect. We're not all logical like Vulcans and Vulcans. They aren't perfect either. <laughs> yeah, no, it definitely turns out. And then, yeah, the character of Yamasaki to me, especially really like towards the end, even when, and we haven't really gotten there, but there's an ultimate betrayal by the Lords because they, like I said, hate all corporeal life forms. They're just using them as puppets basically to fight their war for them. And they abandon them at the end and intend to kill their own soldiers in service of this cause. And this one guy, Yamasaki, who is swayed by their rhetoric, even when that happens, even when he's abandoned by this, still is like, there's got to be a reason why this happened. And he just refuses to accept facts as they're given. And I mean, you know, hopefully this isn't the case for everybody out there, but I'm sure some people have gotten into an argument with a family member or someone online about something where they just refuse to look at the basic facts of a situation and instead are ideologically driven by whatever they believe to just fully support that cause. And even when something is presented to them that flies in the face of that actual real facts about what's really actually happening well, though that's biased, that comes from a tainted source that's completely biased. Whether you're on the right or the left, I'm not. I'm not getting political and saying, you know, this person does this and these people don't. I'm. I'm saying, you know, if if you believe in something and you get scientific evidence that goes against it, some people will double down and not. Ref they will refuse to believe that, and because whatever they've whatever doctrine or ideology they followed takes precedence over that. And we definitely see that with Yamasaki. And another character is a Vulcan character who serves on the enterprise and it's Tanali. And she practices or she falls in the group on Vulcan that they renounce the suppression of emotions and logic and so she's an emotional character. It's the practice of the Vatash Kator. And she, to me, was very interesting because of that. And she was looking to Spock to be her mentor because she thought since he didn't follow the Kulinar all the way through, that, and he was more in touch with emotions, she didn't quite understand that he wasn't just like her. He wasn't, he wasn't against logic. He was looking at the balance of emotion and logic, and she was expecting him to be all emotional. But then at the same time, a surprise how she had hatred for the psionic people and, and, and that she got, she allowed the acceptance of the Lord. There's a scene where we don't know this yet about her, but she's found passed out in the shower. Well, apparently that's the point in time that she accepted the Lord and she went unconscious for a while <laughs> And now she's one of the villains in this. And, and there was, you know, when they had a lot of these, these psionic life forms, the Anar and stuff on the Enterprise early on, and, and they're getting attacked by the Naj. And then we see Ambassador Akalas go in and he's going to help take care of everything and phew, everything explodes and we think everybody's dead, but he actually saved everybody. Mm -hmm. um, it, it's just, there's just so much going on. And, 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 and I, I don't know. I'm just, there's so much going on that my head's spinning right now because there's so many things I want to talk about and now there's just like, they're all blur. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, no, there definitely is a lot going on in this book. And yeah, Tenale, I think, is a character I I was really interested in in this book. And too, yeah. yeah, the fact that she's, you know, one of these, what translates as Vulcans without logic, basically. <laughs> she's interested in exploring her emotions and stuff. I think the book says something really interesting about her reaction to Spock. You know, they say, you know, never meet your heroes, right? Because she had built up Spock to be the, this one thing. And when he fell short of that in her mind, that 
you know, turned her against him in a big way. She was, you know, angered by that, that he wasn't what she expected. I thought that was kind of an interesting thing as well. Yeah. And, you know, I also made me wonder about Cybok. Is he part of that group? The Matash Kator? I've heard. Yeah. I, I, I've, I think I may be misremembering, but I thought he was referred to as such in a later novel where he appeared in might be again, myriad universes or something, but uh, I'm sure listeners will correct me on that because I'm almost certainly wrong. (laughs) I mean, there's so much in this novel. There's a lot to cover and we got some fun facts we'll hit on later, but Dan, you mentioned like, for example, here in the notes, this ends on a hopeful note. So tell us about that. Yeah, I I liked how this novel ended and how, you know, it seems like they're gearing up for this big final battle between, you know, the forces of the Lords and the forces of the Spectres. And that does kind of happen. There is a fight between them and that sort of thing. But what really ultimately ends it is when Spock convinces Tenale to have a mind meld with him to, you know, he'll present his evidence for what the Naj or sorry, not what the Lords are doing with the Naj and, you know, give the Lord a chance to defend himself. But, you know, she comes to understand the truth and that gets communicated to all the rest of the Naj. I thought that was a really great ending in, you know, basically them coming to a realization of the fact that they themselves are victims that it's not the new humans and the Enar who are victims of the specters. They themselves are in fact victims of the Lords rather than having to have this, you know, big drag out defeat of them kind of thing. They have to face what they've done and come to that realization. I I thought that was a really Star Trek ending and it really, really made me appreciate the novel a lot more once I got to that ending. Well, that's really great. I like hearing that. You're right. It is a very much a Star Trek ending. It's not just about battles. I mean, we're we're getting some action and some some battles in here, but it's not just a fight to the finish. You know, it's it's using diplomacy and revealing some things about people and races or whatever that they're doing. And yeah, I liked mm-hmm. it too. Um, I you know. I, I was I'm kind of jumping ahead to our final thoughts of this and our ratings. I'm, I'm not rating it quite yet, but you know I think that's the thing that when I went into this book I didn't really know what to expect, and I really enjoyed that aspect of it. That there were so many things about it that felt like Star Trek, which a Star Trek novel should, and the way it's handled, but also how it ties so many things in Star Trek together to make a cohesive story. So I really like that. That was pretty cool. And Christopher L. Uh, Bennett always does a really good job with that. Mm-hmm. Definitely agreed with that for sure. Uh, I see you here have here in the notes something else that Christopher L. Bennett is always really good at as well. <laughs> and I have to admit some of these definitely made me laugh and appreciate some of these as I was reading. <laughs> Yeah, we got some fun stuff here that we pulled from the book. We typically don't uh, pull out excerpts, but in this case, we are. So we're going to read some of these. But Dan, this is one that you told me about. You were ahead of me in the book, which is funny. You were ahead of me in the book, but then I finished it before you. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I've been having trouble reading lately. I don't know what it is, but I'm, I'll read for like 10, 15 minutes and then just get, I don't know, drowsy or something. I don't know. There's just too much going on in the world or something. I. I try to escape in books, but for some reason, the real world just keeps pulling me back in. I need to get over that. But uh, yeah, this took me a while to read for some reason. <laughs> All right. So tell everybody what you told me, because when I got through this part, I was expecting it and I thought it was hilarious. Yeah. So this is great. So one of the big flubs from Star Trek Three: The Search for Spock, is when Kirk and Admiral Morrow are arguing about the Enterprise and, you know, Scotty says, I want to stay aboard Enterprise for the refit. And Morrow says, there will be no refit. And Kirk says, but the Enterprise and Morrow says, Jim, the Enterprise is 20 years old. Now, the Enterprise is actually like 50 years old at that point. Like it's a lot, you know, but he just messes up the numbers. And there's this great bit in the book where I guess, I don't know, it's just a quirk of Morrow's personality that he's bad with numbers or something. (laughs) So in the book, he says, 
It says, Moro leaned forward. So just imagine how good you'd be now, after 10, 12 years as a starship captain. Kirk replies, close to 15, counting the Sacagawea. Moro waved it off. The numbers don't matter. <laughs> I love that it's just like, yeah, he's just bad with numbers. <laughs> <laughs> 10, 12 years, oh, closer to 50. Ah, numbers don't matter. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. Okay. So now there's this other section, which <laughs> I was not expecting. And I thought, you know what? This is so perfect. If anything, of all shows, this needs to be pointed out because this is literary tracks and we're all about the books and comics. Well, this was a little fun bit that's kind of poking fun at all of us readers and all of the books and all that stuff. So uh, this takes place, uh, if you ever want to uh, go back and read this, if you have the book, it's uh, pages 153 through 155. Oh, and by the way, the Ad Admiral Morrow thing was page 131, if you want to go look at that. Right. <laughs> So uh, this starts off with, okay, I'm going to read this. So here we go. <laughs> Have you seen these? Sulu grinned as he passed a civilian data slate across the restaurant table. Yohora leaned in to read over Chekhov's shoulder as the younger man picked it up and read the titles displayed on it in a boxy, slanted font, Starfleet, the Enterprise Chronicles. Uh, is this that adventure sim series that they based on our missions? Chekhov asked with a grimace. I've seen a few episodes. When Admiral Kirk called it inaccurately larger than life, he's being generous. My accent is nowhere near as exaggerated, and my hair looks nothing like that. And just to interject for a second, that quote, inaccurately larger than life, comes from the motion picture novelization when Kirk is talking about the adventure sims based on their past adventures. Absolutely, yes. And so good <laughs> we read that not that long ago, because yeah, that stood out to me too. Yeah. Uh. Yohora looked at him sidelong. At least your character gets plenty of lines and the occasional love interest. Sulu gestured in agreement. Yes, what about that? Now, I like the older sim about Captain Garth, Chekhov insisted. It helped inspire me to join Starfleet. It's a shame they pulled it from the circulation after this breakdown on Antos IV. Honestly, this one isn't that bad if you step back and look at it objectively. Yuhora observed. I wish they focused more on the junior officers' contributions and thrown in fewer gratuitous fistfights, but there's some generally good writing, and they capture the importance of the work Starfleet does, the dangers and the benefits quite well, she shrugged, allowing for what they had to fictionalize to obscure the classified details. My hair is not classified detail, Nooda. <laughs> <laughs> Anyway, I thought that was funny because, like you said about, like, you know, in the motion picture, we're told that the adventures of the five-year mission are overly exaggerated in Chronicles and stuff. We're picking on Sulu's hair and all this stuff. But then um, the Captain Gar thing, I saw somebody mention this, I think it was in Trek BBS, that they thought this was a, a dig at the Axanar. I was uh, kind of wondering that myself. I, I don't know. For sure, if that's what I thought it was too, possibly. Yeah. But uh, Christopher L. Bennett specified in Trek BBS that that is not the case. Okay, all right. So yeah, I also I, wanted I, to clarify that. I kind of didn't really think it was, but a part of me was wondering in the back of my mind. Yeah. Okay, so then we jump ahead just a little further. Sulu gestured at the data slate. Anyway, it turns out the Sim series is just the tip of the iceberg. There are tie-ins too. Tie-ins. Chekhov asked, what in the world is a tie-in? You know, side merchandise created to supplement the main series. Ever since we stopped V'ger from wiping out Earth, the public's been hungry for more stories about the heroic crew of the Enterprise. So besides the Sim series, there are prose novels, graphic fiction, games. There are hundreds of installments. Hundreds? Chekhov protested. But Starfleet has only cleared incidents from our first five-year mission, and not even all of those. That's the point, Sulu said, his grin widening. The main series adapts our real missions, mostly, but the tie-ins go further afield. Sometimes they do stories that are loosely based on uncleared missions, using what they can reconstruct from news reports and such. But a lot of the time, they completely make things up. Go on, take a look. This stuff is crazy. Yohora leaned closer and read over Chekhov's shoulder as he paged through the illustrated serials of, on the data slate, reacting with startlement and laughter to what they beheld. 
They just annihilated those plant. <laughs> they just annihilated those plant creatures. No attempt at communication. Is that a paper mache Eiffel Tower? The bottled emotions of ancient Vulcans. I really don't think that's how it works. Good Lord, are those gnomes? <laughs> and these creatures look even less like us than the ones in the sim. Chekhov cried. At least they didn't make you blonde. You horror countered. <laughs> And these are hilarious because these, a lot of these little things we're just saying about the plant creatures and Yohora's hair being blonde and such, that we've read in past episodes here on Larry Treks from the Gold Key comics. Yeah, these are definitely the Gold Keys, like especially starting with the plant creatures thing. <laughs> That's so great. <laughs> I should have practiced through this reading. It was the first time I read it out loud. <laughs> but, <laughs> you did a good job. I liked it. <laughs> but uh, I thought this was hilarious. It was just, you know, a call out to, you know, all the books and the, the prose and the comics or whatever and the games. And it's like everything we're reading, everything we're experiencing now with Star Trek in, in the books and the comics and such, they were experiencing too in mm-hmm. the 23rd century. <laughs> I thought that was hilarious. I love that they get reference here. That was a fun little aside thing. So I thought I had to read that one. So anyway, let's uh, give our ratings of this novel as a whole, Dan. What do you think? Yeah, I, it took me a little while to get into this story. I thought it got a little bogged down and complicated with the whole Lords and Spectres thing and, and that kind of thing. So, you know, as I was reading it, I think I was kind of leaning towards a score of three. I, I just wasn't as into this as I thought. But then that ending where it just kind of, I think, had a lot of interesting things to say and ended on that really positive note definitely pulled it up, the score up for me. So I think I would have to give this one four out of five mysterious realms in which the Medusans harbor new humans and Enar. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. You know, I went into this book, I, I don't know, I, I didn't have any, you know, thoughts of what I might be getting, and I, I don't know. I had no expectations. I was just like, okay, I'm going to read the book. And, you know, I started it off, and I was just getting more and more into it, and I think because Christopher L. Bennett is so great at taking all kinds of different aspects of Star Trek and making them seem as if they all tie together in some manner. So, you know, when we say tie in fiction, it means, you know, a book that is tying into the series. But in this case, when it comes to Christopher L. Bennett, tie in to me is like, I'm going to take all these elements in Star Trek and tie them together and make them all make sense that they're all blended into one whole story. And I mean, all the authors kind of do that. But one thing, like, for example, we didn't touch on when the specters start to kind of emerge and, and, and start to become more prominent in these bodies, the human eyes change into that silver glow. Like we saw, like with Gary Mitchell in where no man has gone before. And it's explained that they were inhabited by the specters mm-hmm. that we saw him and Detmer. Uh, inhabited daner yeah i mean daner yeah and that and that was when they went through the galactic barrier that it it brought the the specters to the forefront and they were almost gone crazy because what the great barrier did to the specters Mm -hmm. and they start graying at the temples and stuff yeah yeah so just like little things like that that's what i like about his department temporal investigations he's really good at this. so i was kind of geeking out through this Sometimes I think he goes a little overboard, like, you know, referring to other episodes, like, you know, the character's like, yeah, I remember the time when, and oh, yeah, I remember. When. Sometimes I feel like it gives a little overboard, but I was actually geeking out, and I thought the story was pretty good. I liked it. And like you said, the ending, it was a great wrap up and felt Star Trek. So I was like, I don't know how I rate this, but I'm going to rate it pretty high. So I'm just going to go ahead and say, for me, I'm giving this five specters defeating five lords. Nice. That's an awesome rating. There's one other little bit that I wanted to point out. It was very subtle, but I thought it was just clever. And again, Christopher L. Bennett, just every single little tiny detail, he'll go over it with a fine tooth comb and explain it somehow. He was talking about the realm that they found themselves in, this kind of little pocket universe thing. And he says, you know, if you look at it, 
at, at one minute it seems to be this kind of reds and purples and stuff but then like if you squint it like turns into this green blue thing and like it's it didn't really change but it just it just depends on how you perceive it that's the difference between the original effect in the episode mm-hmm. Is there in truth no beauty? And then the remastered edition of it with the new special effects. I was like, wow, okay, so <laughs> that gets explained in this. <laughs> I thought, like, good lord, that's hilarious. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> I know. I think that's what I'm saying, like, geeking out. Like, if you're a big Star Trek fan, you pick up on all these little things. And especially if you read the novels, he picks up things from other novels and such. And there's one thing that we didn't talk about, what I mentioned earlier about the bridge of these crew members and what they're doing at the time. And this is something I used to read fanzines back in the early 90s that took place during this period. I think that's another reason why I'm really liking this book, because I want more in this time period. Hmm. But... um I don't like it when Star Trek fiction says, oh, okay, after five years of the second mission that, you know, they all went to teach at Starfleet Academy and Chekhov went to the Reliant. I like to think their crew did more than that. Mm-hmm. But, you know, Sulu was offered a, a position on the Bozeman. On the Bozeman. Yeah, yeah. that's from the uh, novel The Captain's Daughter by Peter exactly. David. Exactly. Yeah. Yes. And, uh, but then he's going to stay and raise Demora, uh, his daughter. And, uh, but then I think in the novelization of the Wrath of Khan, it's mentioned that then he eventually took a position on the Exeter and he Hmm. worked under Captain Hunter. I don't remember which novel it is. Maybe it's Captain's Daughter, but Sula goes back to serve in a prominent position, Starfleet, and Demora is now older, so she is now being raised by Ran. She lives with mm. Ran for a while. She helps raise her, and so uh, and that leads to him to eventually going to being offered the captain's position on the Excelsior. Mm-hmm. But anyway, I'm going too deep in stuff. But Yohora's <laughs> on a ship with Scotty. She is now a science officer on a vessel that's prominent in this book, and Sky's the engineer of that vessel. Yeah, and that ship is Malachowski class, which was one of the ship classes from the Battle of the Binary Stars in the second episode of Star Trek Discovery, the USS Clark, I think, which I actually oh, have a model of beside me here. That's but, so cool. Yeah. Like, I just yeah. love all these little touchstones and bringing in all the disparate parts of Star Trek together. Yeah. And, and Kurt uh, accepts the position at Starfleet Academy, but he also wants to be a flag officer. So he gets to control fleets at times and, and use the Empress for special missions. But in the ne- meantime, Spock has it as captain. And then we also have, you know, Chekhov on the Reliant with uh, Captain Terrell, but Chekhov's the second officer. And so, you know, we see some adventures and that ship is prominent. So I guess my point is, I like the fact that this crew didn't just go to the academy and teach for like five or seven years, that they were actually serving on other starships and other prominent roles while maybe occasionally helping out at the, at Starfleet Academy, but they were actively doing other things. Yeah, no, definitely. It's uh yeah, like I said, it's it's great to have like all these little bits kind of pulled together, even from other books and the the acknowledgments bit at the back of the book. Anybody listening to this, I highly recommend you read through the acknowledgments to kind of get an appreciation of all the little bits that he's brought in. And also, uh, I haven't checked this out, but Christopher L. Bennett always does annotations for his novels on his website, and these ones are apparently already up, which is is great. So I'm going to definitely check those out when i get a chance yeah i started reading through some of them i haven't read through them all but yeah there's a little good tidbits in there too so definitely check those out you know we've said it before that these discussions definitely give me a new appreciation for the novels that you know maybe i didn't have the best experience reading this one i didn't i I enjoyed it i thought it was pretty good but again these discussions just make me realize how much there is and how how much work goes into these novels and how much there really is to appreciate in them i i don't think i could ever write a star trek novel not to these levels no (laughs) i I would embarrass myself i i mean i'd have to turn in my trek card because i know i would mess something up and I get the details right. Or <laughs> to be uh, fair, though, that's something. what a good editor is for. So well, you that's know, true. yeah, I think I'll you have could you do edit. It. You'll edit my book, Dan. <laughs> 
well, then the buck would stop at me for sure. <laughs> That's <laughs> <Exactly>. not good. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's been fun talking about writing and editing our own books today, but this isn't the only thing we've been discussing on the network. So here's a quick look at some of the other things you may have missed elsewhere on Trek FM. Previously on Trek.FM, The Ready Room. Narek is a character not really working for me right now. You don't like the uh, sexy, sultry bad boy of the Romulan Empire? Oh, I guess, but I don't know. Sometimes I think of, like, (laughs) if he's the sultry bad boy, it's kind of like if Ross from Friends were the bad boy, like he's trying to be cool. I I don't get it. Uh, (laughs) He really likes leather pants, too, so. Earl Grey. And Data's head gets sewn back on... His other body, so we have two different parts of data now. Okay, so by sewing on, do you mean like stitched with fabric? <laughs> well, how else are you going to attach a head to a body? Um, electromagnetic interlocking. But then know. with the skin? Well, yeah, you know. Primitive culture. A look at history and culture through Star Trek. Asking the fans what they want is a kind of folly. They'll know it when they see it, and they'll reject it if it's crummy. Somebody said to me early on, well, you can't kill Spock. I said, sure, you can kill him. The only question is whether you kill him well. To the journey! Something drastic like that must have happened because that's my big question. Like, okay, why does Seven feel like she has no family? What about her Voyager family? Yeah. Where are they? Why aren't they in her life? It could be she's self-isolating. For some reason, she just kind of fell out with everyone and has been hanging out in the former neutral zone for some reason or she's another. She's looking for toilet paper. It, looking for toilet paper? Do the Borg need toilet paper? Everyone needs toilet paper. Can you imagine what a Borg toilet would look like? It would be it's green. Weird. Well, probably. <laughs> yeah, you remember when they had color toilet paper? No. No. And that's what else is happening on Trek.fm. Check out all these shows and join the conversation about your favorite corner of the Star Trek universe and beyond. And you'll find us wherever you get your podcasts. If you're an Apple user, be sure to hit that subscribe button in Apple Podcasts on iPhone, iPad, or Apple TV, or the desktop iTunes app to get the latest episodes as soon as they're published. And we would love it if you'd leave us a star rating and a written review. If you're not an Apple user, though, we've got you covered as well. You can find our shows on Google Play Music, Stitcher, TuneIn, Spreaker, SoundCloud, Windows Phone, YouTube, in most third-party apps. And you can stream and download the MP3 file from our website or grab the RSS link. If you'd like to help us keep all our shows coming to you each week, you can become a patron of the network on Patreon. Visit patreon.com slash trekfm. That's p-a-t-r-e-o-n dot com slash trekfm to get all the details. Perks include early access to episodes, exclusive content, producer credits, and more, available through our patrons' website, Patron Zone. It requires a great deal of money to produce, host, and distribute these shows each month, and we really appreciate any support you can give us and hope you'll join the team. Again, you'll find all the details at patreon.com slash trekfm. And Dan, you mentioned about giving us a positive review on iTunes. We got one recently from Brandon H83, and it's titled Books and Comics Positively, and it's five stars. And Brandon H3 says, This is a great show for discussion, interviews, news, and commentary about Star Trek books and comics. The hosts while always giving their actual takes on the material, try to find the goodness in whatever they review and do not take pleasure in bashing anything. There's a good sense of humor present in the episodes too. Well, thanks Brandon H83 for that review. Really appreciate it. I'm glad you focused in on our positively track when we do literary tricks. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. No, I definitely appreciate that review. That was really nice. And uh, yeah, I, I, I'm glad that that's kind of the image we're putting forward is one of positivity and, and being positive. So that that's that's awesome. We're we're all about positively trek in this. Yeah, exactly. But you know, the thing is, it's not like oh, we're trying to be positive or oh, yeah. This is just who we are. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I know? mean, honestly, yeah, that's true. I, I don't bash things, so, you know. <laughs> yeah, I'm not about that, for sure. 
Well, we would love to hear your thoughts on today's show and the show in general. And there are many ways for you to do that. The best place is to join the larger conversation in the Babel Conference. That's our listeners group on Facebook. Just type Babel, B-A-B-E-L, into the search field on Facebook and it should come right up. And we will, of course, read your comments uh, if they are written to us in a timely manner for the next episode. If you'd like to send us an email, you can use the form on our website at trek.fm slash contact. Choose to send to a show and select Literary Treks, and that'll come right to the two of us. You can also find the network on Twitter, that's at trek.fm, and on Facebook at facebook.com slash trek.fm. Find us on our Goodreads group where we have bookshelves with all of our previously covered books, as well as the currently reading section, so you know what is coming up for future shows, plus great conversations happening about the books and the comics. So just go in there, okay, and search for Literary Treks on Goodreads and click Join Group and we'll let you right in. We'd like to thank Norman C. Lau, Ken Tripp, Greg Rozier, Brandon Shea Mutala, Justin Ozer, Jeffrey Harlan, and Casey Pettit for their support of the Trek FM Network and being associate producers for Literary Treks as well. So, Dan, when you're not reading Starfleet, the Enterprise Chronicles, where can people find you? (laughs) Well, you can find me tweeting about that on uh, my Twitter account. That's at Kurtrats, K-E-R-T-R-A-T-S. You can also find me making videos about that on my YouTube channel, youtube.com slash Kurtrats Productions. And uh, my website, treklet.com, where I talk about Star Trek, or sorry, the Starfleet Chronicles uh, books, both old and new. And that's, like I said, at treklet.com. And uh, so, Bruce, when you're not making sure that you have your special red visor on straight so that you can safely beam in a Medusan ambassador, where can we find you? Well, you can find me also wearing that as a beam them out even though kirk's in the room and he doesn't have the visor on oh whoops yeah watch that in the episode that's mm. that's uh ah, he's that's kirk again. he's awesome <laughs> <laughs> but you can find me on twitter at admiral underscore rex and you can find me and dan both on twitter at positively treks and of course that is our podcast positively trek so check that out it's like this show but more about everything whatever star trek whatever we feel like talking about we'll take requests too we just won't sing and then you can find me also on uh live from the edge with brandy jackala when there's a new episode discovery that's here on part of the network so go back and listen to those episodes when you watch uh season one and two uh, if you're doing a rewatch or whatever on those. And then also on the Star Wars Report podcast, I'm on there occasionally now. So check those out. And of course, you know what? I'm always in the Babel Conference. I mean, who is it, right? So, exactly. Eh, eh, yeah, I don't know. Yeah, yeah, that's the story. Yeah. Well, thanks everyone for listening. And until next time, live long and read on. You call that light reading? To each his own, number one.